I want to explore is this idea of what, 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 if, what if it really does come down to trust? Like, what if trust really is the first thing, uh, the most important thing? And to which you might go, like, what, what's the it there? Like, we forgot the subject. Are we talking marriage? Are we talking business? Are we talking uh, friendship? Or, or are we talking involvement in community? Or are we talking about our teammates? Like, what are we talking about? To which I think my refrain would be yes. Like, what, 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 if, what if it really does come down to trust? What if it really is the first movement? I was thinking this week of, remember those, uh, like, maybe they still have them at Applebee's, but I'm guessing not because they just have iPads. Uh, but... Remember the dot to dots you would do as a kid? And I guess the question that I want to explore and the image that I want to try to create for you this morning is, uh, what if trust really is the equivalent of that movement from one to two? And sure, we can go one to three or we can go one to ten and finish from there. And yeah, we'll probably have some semblance of a rhinoceros or a brontosaurus or something, uh, but probably not to the full extent that it could be. And I wonder, what if trust, what if it really is the first thing? And as we look back at Psalm 23, we're going to spend the next few weeks just kind of reiterating and and hopefully exploring with more depth Psalm 23. But you're probably figuring out by now, Psalm 23 really just has one idea explored from several different metaphors. And the idea is this idea of of a God uh, who's a good shepherd. And therefore, I, I wonder if part of what Psalm 23 is doing is begging us to somehow attend to and move toward, and maybe the reason why it's been used liturgically on a daily basis for so many people, maybe the reason why it's for, for hundreds, thousands of years it's been a part of people's daily and weekly routine is because of the way that it beckons us back to the fundamental is- issue of trust, <clears throat> of, of living in light of the fact that there is a God uh, and that this God desires to be our shepherd, that he desires to, to make us secure, to, 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 to meet our needs, to provide for us. And yet, when I, even when I say those words, and this is part of where I get in my own head, and probably you do as well, that, that there's a tension, isn't there? Like it, in fact, there are people, a part of this community, that for me, as I was thinking about talking about this good shepherd who takes care of you and keeps you secure, it's like, yeah, but... There's this tension, isn't there? And for some of us, we have the luxury of that tension, that apparent conflict between God's goodness and our circumstance. For some of us, uh, that, that's probably intellectual. I think that's probably more the case for me than not. Like, because we know we live in this global context and we know that there's some poor 12-year-old girl living somewhere in Southeast Asia who's believing in God to get her out of sex slavery, but it's been years. And we know intellectually that there's some poor widow, mother in sub-Saharan Africa who's believing in God to help provide for her, for her kids, and yet it's not happening. And so there's this, this tension that I think we have to deal with that Psalm 23, and we've said this from the very beginning, it makes these massive claims which, if true, are pretty awesome, but if not true, are grossly religiously misleading. But for some of you, it's not an intellectual tension or conflict at all. For some of you, it's life because, like, suddenly you got to you got a diagnosis. Suddenly, you're a widower or a widow. Suddenly, you're divorced. Suddenly, you're filing bankruptcy. Suddenly, your relationships have deteriorated. And there's this, there's this thing that happens, and I think we would be perfectly normal for them to happen, where we go, okay, yeah, but what about this whole Psalm 23 shepherd thing? And here's the, here's the question that, I, that I, I, just, I, th- I think I just want us to focus on this morning is, is what if Psalm 23 isn't naive to that tension? Like what if it's not superficial and it's not written by some 13-year-old who's only known success and health at this point in their life? But what if Psalm 23, actually the reason it's been treasured for hundreds, thousands of years is because of the way it wants to meet us at that intersection? To somehow deal honestly with the tension of a God who says, I'm here, And a God who knows about divorce and death and cancer and relational breakdown and the myriad other things that we know come with what it means to be human. And what if, therefore, the reason Psalm 23 has been so treasured is because of the way it honestly helps us greet those moments? You know, the Apostle Paul, perhaps the most famous early Christian because he did so much writing, uh, many of his letters are contained in what is now called the New Testament. Uh, It it seems that one of his summaries of the benefit of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus were summarized in three words because he seems to return to that. He does return to them often. Faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. 
If you're anything like me, that, that they're so familiar and you've seen them painted on so many walls and on so many coffee mugs that they kind of lose their value. But I think, I, I wonder if, if it's true that trust is the most important thing, that it's the first domino, that it's the movement from one to two, maybe Paul saw them even as chronologically valuable. Because faith, we think of faith as something we possess like when you, when you go to your first communion, when you get baptized, and sure, it, 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 I suppose it's a noun in some sense, but, but faith is trust. It's a verb. It's, it's this reminder that we, you, don't, you don't just become a Christian and then you are one. You choose to be one within every moment of your life. And I wonder if what Paul's getting at there is if there is no trust, there's no faith, there really can be no hope. Can there? Because the older I get, the more I realize that if, if everything depends upon me, then then me's in trouble. There's very little to have hope on if there's nothing outside of myself to, to trust. And, and all the more love. Like, if, if there's no trust, then I don't know that there can be any love because, frankly, I don't, I, I, it takes everything I've got to take care of me. I don't have anything left for anybody else. I wonder if, if trust, and this is why I say like in, the, in honor of Vince Lombardi, maybe it's important to just return to this idea of this thing called Christianity that you may have been a part of for decades or maybe you're just exploring for the first time or maybe you're coming back to, we make it into this big thing and we talk theology and we do different series and we talk about all these complicated things and nuanced things and they're fun to talk about, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about is rolling out of bed in the morning and choosing to believe whether or not when you walk out your front door... God is good and can be trusted. And wouldn't trust, therefore, be exploring the the tension, the conflict between our circumstances and the claims of Psalm 23? You know, some of you know I've been studying academically this this vocational practice called spiritual directing uh, for about a year and a half now. It's something that I'm studying at George Fox, and my interest in it is uh, I'm, I'm convinced that if, if in the next 10 years we, we could influence Helena to have uh, a handful of spiritual directors, I think it would go a long ways towards helping people in the ways we're trying to help them explore their spiritual lives, because what spiritual directing is, as I'm understanding it, and by the way, one of my professors will be here early April to speak more directly to it, and we're going to do a series in March on it. But what spiritual directing is, is it's based upon this fundamental assumption that sometimes we don't need new information and sometimes we don't need therapeutic solutions to our problems, though those things both help. And sometimes we don't need a sermon. Sometimes we just need someone to listen to us. And spiritual directing as a practice is is, is creating a space where someone can just talk out loud about the goings on with God in their life. And the belief is that in talking out loud, God's spirit will show up and help us gain an awareness of what God is doing and help guide and lead us. So that's its own conversation, but it's all to say that I, because I'm studying it, I've also had to acquire a spiritual director. And I'm working with this guy. His name is Robert Marshall. He's a retired Navy chaplain. Lives in Bremerton, Washington, actually. Uh, He's this really, really neat guy. We'll bring him out here sometime. But we we met this last Monday, and he started our conversation. Uh, It's just a phone thing that we do which I like because I can pace around in my basement and I don't have to sit and I also don't have to look him in the eye, which is also very convenient. Because my professor, I asked her one time, so how long will you let the silence go? Because they, they'll just stare, she'll just stare at you. I said, how long will you let the silence go before you break it? She said, eight minutes. I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't think I could stare at someone for eight seconds without nervously breaking <laughs> the silence. So I like the phone. He said, Here's how we started our conversation. And again, his goal is to get me talking so I can hear myself and hear from God's spirit. He said, so Adam, where is your spirituality, or where is your life, excuse me, Adam, where is your life bumping into your spirituality? And I love the question because to me, it, it's Psalm 23. It assumes, not that if my spirituality is right, life is perfect. It assumes that we'll constantly be dealing with the conflict between these two things. What if that's what Psalm 23 calls us to? Now, there's another psalm written by David that I think overlaps, but it's going to sound like a rabbit trail for a few minutes, but trust me. Let's look at Psalm 8, and I'm I'm just going to put it on the screen. We're going to read exclusively from the message this morning because some of the passages we're going to look at are so familiar, so fundamental, that I thought this might help us just break up our mind's familiarity. Psalm 8, I think we're starting in verse 3 here. I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky jewelry, Moon and stars mounted in their settings. Then I look at my micro self and I wonder, why do you bother with us? 
Why take a second look our way? Now, what is the psalmist doing here? Hold, hold on, just hold it there for just a second. What is the psalmist doing here? I mean, there's a sense, and you, you can spend some time on this this week if you like, but there's this sense where, where he's doing the things we do where you, you look at creation, you see the grandeur of it, you see the beauty of it, you see the size, the magnitude of it, and it's fair to say David had no idea relative to today how big it really was. And he's blown away. I was coming across Acropolis on Friday morning and uh, on, a, on a run in the morning and it caught it just where the sun was rising and like the snow was pink and I'm looking at my dog going, do you even appreciate what's going on here? <laughs> but that, that's what he's marveling at. But it, he takes it even deeper than that, the psalmist does. Because he asked this question, which I think is a fair question. It, it almost seems like he's going, and I look at all of it and I go, would we be better off would it be better off if we weren't here? Like, why, why are there humans? And is it really possible, is it really feasible that God, in the midst of how massive this is, you know me? Like, you want to know me personally? I mean, well, you don't expect to have a relationship with the governor or the president of the United States because there's this assumption that the, the, the bigger and more successful you get, the, the, the more removed you get. And the claim here that the psalmist is reflecting on is that this God, he made me? And there's this, I suppose, academic question of what's the purpose of humans, but then there's this personal question of like, what's the purpose of me? And, and why, why am I here? And then look where the psalmist goes, because of course, what he's noting is something he's learned. This isn't happening real time. Yet you've so narrowly missed, excuse me, it, yet we've so narrowly missed being gods, bright with Eden's dawn light. You put us in charge of your handcrafted world. You put us in charge of your handcrafted world, repeated to us your Genesis charge, made us lords of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild, birds flying and fish swimming, whales singing in the ocean deeps. So again, we're fundamental here, but what is, what is the psalmist reflecting upon? That the unique role of humans is that, that we're stewards of what God has created. That somehow we function in concert with this God. Which would mean, and here's Dallas Willard's suggestion, that as a human, one of the unique things you can do that, that nothing else can is trust God. Or maybe better said, one of the things you can do that perhaps nothing else in the created order can is distrust God. God, which, which you go like, wait a minute, that was a conversation about what we do for God, which leads us to a conversation of what has to be in place before you can do anything for God. There's this conversation of trust. Genesis 2-7 is this r reminder. Go ahead to that. God formed man out of the dirt of the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The man came alive, a living being. Sorry for the gender-specific language. Uh, of course, that was the culture, but certainly the text is, is accounting for, for humanity. But we're not talking about oxygen here, are we? What are we talking about? This, this reflection, and again, remember, these are real people who really lived through lives like ours, who had this reflection, and it led them to believe, like, wait a minute, I'm a little bit different. There's like a piece of God in me. I'm called to kind of live out of this place. Why? Because God made me to be an extension of him. And what does that require but trust? There's a guy named uh, Martin Buber, which I've known of him forever, but the thing I love about Google these days is when you're awkward about how to pronounce something, you can put it into Google and ask how to pronounce it because his name is spelled B-U-B-E-R, and I've always wondered. I don't, I don't want to stand on the stage and say Martin Buber. It's just too weird. So I learned that if you just say it with an accent or a fake one, then that's, so it's Martin Buber. I, I, don't, I don't know what his, uh, he, he had this concept called I, it, or I, thou. Maybe you've heard of this. His reflection was there's two ways of relating to the world. One is you and a bunch of its, a bunch of things. But Martin, who I'm all but certain was, was Jewish in his background, he said the other option we have, uh, the, the, if you will, the advanced, more mature, more healthy option, he would say, is I thou. There's me, and there's a bunch of images of God. There's a bunch of people who are also of God, from God, holding God's spirit within them. All called collectively to do what? 
to move creation in God's direction, to, to function. It's why it's so important to, in my mind that the kingdom of God is understood by us not as church, not as institution, not as reading your Bible, not as prayer, not as your favorite spiritual discipline. Those are all the equivalent of lifting weights. The kingdom of God is what? It's, it's work. It's, it, it's, it's how you treat people when, when, when life is really happening. Because the invitation of God is to be an extension of him in those places. Which would lead then to this question. If it's true that trust is the fundamental thing, if it's true that God made us to to serve and work on his behalf with him, then trust and working together are are inseparable, aren't they? I I mean, think about this. If in a job, if there's a point at which you can't trust the the person you work for, it's toast, right? Andy Stanley said for years, uh, the, the worst thing you can possibly do is lie. Why? Because he says that if, 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 there, if, if, if there's no truth, there's no grounds for relationship. Here's where I think we could spend a little time thinking, though. So in the narrative, in the story, when evil first shows up, what does it seek to undermine? What does it attack? Genesis 3, there's this story. And again, it's not important that we think about it as necessarily like we don't have to get caught up in evolution and all that stuff because these guys aren't thinking about this. But listen to the st- story. Go ahead to the next slide. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. He spoke to the woman. Do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? Which is fundamentally not what God said. He flipped it. One tree you can't. He says you can't eat from any. There's this undermining of trust. And of course, uh, this archetypal idea of the fall or or this, however you think about that, things deteriorate. And and then you've got people who are sideways with God, but God comes toward them. So contrary to the way we present it, God doesn't turn his back on people because of sin. He pursues them. And it culminates here in in verse 10. Go ahead to that next slide. He said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. So God's like, where are you? And Adam and Eve are hiding, and they say, whoa, 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 why are you hiding? Because I realized I was naked. Now, naked, what does that mean? Of course, it's not speaking about clothes. It's speaking about the dream that you've had since you were six years old where you, in the middle of the night, or you, you dream about going to the grocery store and you forgot to put your pants on, which really isn't about clothes, is it? Don't tell me I'm the only one that's had that dream. <laughs> it's about vulnerability. Now, here, here's... and. and Really, for me, everything I'm working toward is this point, because this, for me, was super helpful this last summer when I read this. In the Archaeology Study Bible, part of what they talked about is that in ancient cultures around the Jewish culture, all other cultures, as best they can tell, vulnerability was a bad thing, which kind of makes sense, uh, because the higher you go up on any kind of social hierarchy, at least in theory, the less vulnerable you become. Uh, the more you control the resources, the more you have broad-ranging relationships. And so in other cultures, the goal was the elimination of or the avoidance of vulnerability. You didn't, you didn't want vulnerability. You ran from vulnerability. This story is saying what? This story starts in the opening pages, this, this framework by which a person can choose to live their life that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. It starts with a framework that says what? You are, by your very nature, vulnerable. You, uh, what, what philosophers call, you are a contingent being, which means you do not have in yourself what it takes to survive. This story Interesting, isn't it? The tension here is an evil force that wants to undermine trust and a God who says, yeah, yeah, you're right. You are vulnerable, made to be vulnerable, made to recognize that tension, made to roll out of bed in the morning and reflect upon your worries and the problems and just recognize, God, somehow what it means to be a follower of you is to somehow embrace the fact that every time I worry about something, if it's legitimate or not, especially if it's legitimate, there's this sense of like, yep. Some of you have done it already this morning because you've got a high school kid who's in Bozeman coming back from a retreat this morning and you've already kind of done the things that we can all do. I've done because you catastrophized because they're driving back from Bozeman in sub-zero temperatures with, with snow on the ground. And without being stupid or irresponsible, I wonder if the story is is to identify, yep, God, 
what it means to have relationship with you, what it means to embrace what you say it means to be human is not to avoid the vulnerability, but to wrap my arms around it, greet it, and understand this is what the faith journey involves. I, I wonder if our almost epidemic issues with anxiety, and I say that as, as one who has it myself, is, is really, if it all hinges upon this very concept, do we go with ancient Near Eastern Mesopotamian cultures that say vulnerability is at its core something that you avoid? Or do we embrace that what it means to be human is to be vulnerable? And to find a way, sure, yeah, be responsible. I'm not trying to say we just sit on our couch and pray. But at the end of the day, Maybe the reason Jesus talked about worry the way he did is because, because what he was embracing was the fact that he was vulnerable. And he knew what it meant, means to be human is to be vulnerable. I, I try to say this every wedding I perform. I, I did it once really explicitly and it was really awkward where I just looked at the groom and I was like, what if she, what if she opts out? What if he opts out? Guess what the answer to the question is? You, you can't guarantee that, that that doesn't happen. That's what marriage is. It's entering into a vulnerable relationship, and it, it just is. And just because you name it doesn't mean it's not going to happen either, does it? I wonder if the faith journey is in some level getting to know the good shepherd better and better and better so that we can become more and more effective at just embracing our vulnerability. I, I was having some fun with this this summer and it was kind of therapeutic and cathartic for me and just my own kind of daily worries. And then it all culminated in, in late July. Uh, there was this kind of combo couple days where we were going to go backpacking, which isn't my favorite thing, but I'm learning to, to do it. But it does expose, because I just didn't grow up doing it, so backpacking for me exposes the fact that I'm vulnerable, which you are. Like, someone breaks a leg four miles back in the mountains, it's a little bit bigger deal than if they break the, their leg in your front yard. So I was, the, my, my attempts to just embrace my vulnerability kind of culminated over this backpacking thing that we did on a Thursday night, and then we came out on Friday, and we had to drive from um, south of Butte all the way to Billings, because my boys were playing in a wood bat tournament on Saturday and Sunday, and we had two vehicles there, because Teresa had to work Sunday, so initially she was just going to come home from the backpacking thing, and then we talked her into going to Billings. And so we were driving uh, the, the interstate going up the Butte Pass, headed towards Billings, which... Uh, when you're from Helen, you don't drive the pass, that pass as often, but when you're from Billings, every time you go west, you drive through that pass. And I'm, I'm pretty terrible at provoking spiritual conversations with my boys, uh, but I was just kind of loving this vulnerability thing, and I started, I was talking with them about it as we were coming up on the, on the Butte Pass, and I'm not a, you know, I'm an 84 mile an hour kind of guy, so I'm not a big speed guy, but I know the Butte Pass to be this fun pass where you can kind of put your foot on the floor and you can keep your speed, and it's kind of fun. And so, we were barreling up the Butte Pass, and I'm talking about vulnerability and having a good old time in my intellectualizing, trying to be t intentional with the boys there. And we were just about to crest the pass, and I remember looking in the rearview mirror and thinking, wow, there was a lot of dust on this thing from our backpacking trip, which it should have occurred to me we drove 50 miles since we got off the dirt road, so it wasn't dust. No sooner did I have that thought, I looked down, and the temperature gauge on the expedition was just pegged to the right. And then what really saved me was the, the dope light, which it turns out I need those, was flashing at me saying that my, the thing was hot. So we, I pulled the expedition over on the side of the road. Teresa, fortunately, was behind us, pulled in behind us. So here we are, like, just at the top of the Butte Pass, past the, the rest area. It's about 95 degrees on a Friday afternoon in the last weekend of July. So there's four million cars driving by us. And steam's barreling out of the hood of the car. I've got three children and a dog on the side of the road. I mean, it was perfect. You just couldn't have planned it any better. So I call my friend Steve like, hey, Steve, what's going on here? And he's like, I'm thinking head gasket because something like that. And he kind of tells me, by the way, you check if, if you think it's your head gasket, you check the dipstick. And if it's kind of milky, then, yep, you're toast. But that wasn't the case. And I, we couldn't find a blown hose. I couldn't, just couldn't figure it out. So we started dumping water bottles in, and we could see it drain, couldn't find it. And Steve said, well, just see if you can limp it to Whitehall. I'll meet you in Whitehall, to his credit. So we we're close to the crest of the pass, so it didn't take much to kind of crest it and then illegally you know, drive with the motor off down the pass. <laughs> and then we got to the bottom of the pass, and that, like, you take for granted those rolling hills between Butte and Whitehall. But the, the game that we played for about the next hour plus was per Steve's uh, wisdom and counsel, was I'd start the thing in the, on the shoulder, I'd start the expedition, drive it 
at 30 miles an hour until the, the gauge pegged, which would take about 20 seconds, and then I'd turn it off, and then I would just coast until literally, like, gravity stopped us dead. <laughs> I'd put it in park, turn it off, sit there for three minutes, and we did that as we were trying to limp our way to, to Whitehall. Well, at one point, uh, Teresa decided just to go into town and get a bunch of gallons of water because we were done with, we were out of the water that we did have, and so she came back, and I can't remember who it was. Someone's like, why don't you just pour it until you figure out where it's coming out? Which, again, I'm not a genius, so I hadn't thought of that. So we just started pouring, and we're like on the third gallon. And finally, uh, I think it was Chase was like, hey, look right there. And there was just a spot where just a little one-inch plastic T that connects with the heater hoses, the, the T itself had broke. And so once we found that, I was like, oh, geez, that's a piece of cake. And I grabbed my Leatherman, and there was enough of the plastic left to reattach it. And we drove into Whitehall and paid some guy 100 bucks to fix a $5 part. And an hour later, we were on the road. And as I was driving to Billings, it, it occurred to me, the danger here is that we embrace our vulnerability for want of not being vulnerable. Like The danger would be that we wrap our hearts and our lives around Psalm 23, believing somewhat superstitiously, which religion all too often tends to do, believing superstitiously that if we name it, then it's actually not there. Like if I, if I name my vulnerability, then maybe I'm not vulnerable. And I wonder if Psalm 23 is actually doing the exact opposite. That what it's doing is meeting us in our vulnerable moments and inviting us to live a life around this fundamental idea of trust. Now, a friend of mine and a friend of many of yours tells a story that I want you to hear that I think says this better uh, than I can. It was a Friday night uh, this last August when Lene and I had just finished up a hot date at Costco and we had bought an area rug for our basement. And I had been working on the basement all summer, so I was excited to get this area rug in there. It was going to tie the room together. We got downstairs and I struggled with trying to get that plastic wrapping off of it for like five minutes and realized that that wasn't going to work. And so I jogged back upstairs and it was getting close to Oliver's bedtime and so we were, I was kind of frantic and, and rushed. So the only knife that we had uh, was... I should have known was not the right tool for the job. It was a long knife like this and pointy and kind of dull, um, but I was in a hurry. So I grabbed that knife uh, and ran back down, walked back downstairs, right, Oliver? We don't run with knives. And uh, got down, and I was straddling the area rug and cutting up through the plastic like this. And Oliver had followed me down, and he was kind of in a playful mood, and so he sat on the area rug opposite from me, I should have recognized the risk there, but uh, again, I was in a rush and we were just kind of going in a hurried fashion. Um, and so it just so happened that on one of the, the strokes up, Oliver decided to lurch forward. And so when the, the knife came up and the pointed end came up, he basically face planted onto the knife. It caught him right here, like less than an inch away from his eye. So I, I knew that there was going to be some, some moderate to severe physical uh, damage, but I didn't really recognize the potential for emotional or psychological damage there until in the days and weeks following this, uh, I was processing it with my sister, who happens to be a child psychologist working in a children's hospital in Los Angeles and specializes in trauma in children under five. And one day she, she I guess, pulled me aside. She said, you know, I've seen a lot of kids undergo similar degrees of trauma and resulting from that have to undergo a lot of therapy. But she said she didn't think that Oliver would have much, if anything, that he would have to work through as a result of this. She had asked me if there was anything that happened that night, um, the night of the incident, that allowed him to sort of focus on something outside of the chaos and kind of pull out of that emotional turmoil that was surrounding him. Um, and when she, she asked me that, I kind of immediately knew what had happened. That night in the ER, it all kind of culminated um, in a moment where the nurse was leaning over Oliver, who was restrained in a bed sheet and couldn't move. And he just looked at me so helplessly. And I just felt so uh, out of control at that moment. Um, and it was then that the nurse looked up at me and asked if there was a song that I knew that I could sing to comfort him. When I was Oliver's age, or about three years old, uh, my parents started singing a hymn to me every night before bed. And the hymn was Psalm 23. And we sang it so many times that about a year and a half ago when Oliver asked me to sing him a song before bed, uh, I was able to sing that song without having sung it in over 20 years um, and just recall it from memory. And I immediately knew uh, that Psalm 23 was what I should sing. 
Um, and so I sang that, and before I even got through the first line, Oliver, who was in hysterics, had stopped screaming and just locked his eyes on me and visibly just calmed down. I sang that song I don't know how many times, but we sang it over and over and over. When I relayed that story to my sister, she just smiled and kind of gave her opinion that that was what had prevented Oliver from having this manifest in his psyche as part of his view of me and of knives and hospitals. I see so much grace in this story because it's so counter to my personality. I'm terrible at like routine and doing things just for the sake of doing them or out of habit. Um, and this is one instance where we've been doing this out of habit for years, um, and the amount of grace that showed up in that, uh, to use that to prevent this longer lasting trauma. It's a promise that when you go through these tough times, that God will be there with you. And not to trivialize instances where that doesn't feel like the case for people that go through stuff like this, um, or even much worse than this. But it was just a very clear picture of um, at least one more tool to acknowledge God's presence in these tough times. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.